Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Domenico Grasso, uh, Chancellor here at uh, UVM Dearborn, and I, along with uh, Professor Deborah Smith Pollard, where is she? Oh, there she is. She's right in front of me. Uh, are co chairing uh, the strategic planning uh, initiative that we've launched uh, just a few months ago. And as part of that initiative, we are bringing thought leaders from around the country to share with us their experiences on exciting things that they have done or observed or can suggest us as we uh, launch our initiative and it'll help us inform our, our thinking. And today we're very fortunate to have uh, Mark Searle, the Provost and Executive Vice President from Arizona State University. So as you recall, uh, our first thought leader was Rick Miller, who talked about some exciting things that he did at Olin College, but at Olin, he had a blank slate. They built a program ab initio, so there was no history. Here, we have an exciting uh, initiative in Arizona that had to deal with the, the history and the past ghosts of any institution. So this is going to be an exciting uh, presentation. Mark is uh, a native Canadian, and I understand was the property of the Chicago Blackhawks for some time, <laughs> and uh, then uh, went off to college uh, at Winnipeg and did his PhD at the University of Maryland and worked in government in Manitoba at uh, North Dakota State and has been at uh, ASU since 1998, five. Five, 1995. So he actually predates Michael Crow, who you may know as a, uh, as a very visionary and aggressive and uh, bold leader in higher education. So one of the things that uh, can tell you how smart Mark is, as many of you know that are in higher education, it is very difficult to find time to do things that you enjoy. Uh, for instance, leisure things that you enjoy. So what uh, Mark did was he decided to make leisure studies part of the focus of his research. <laughs> so he is a renowned scholar in, uh, in leisure studies along with uh, health and human performance. He, started the, he was the founding director of the program for health, leisure, and human performance at the University of Manitoba. And he is a, a member of the Academy of Leisure Sciences uh, and the Academy for Park and Recreation Administration. So he's a renowned scholar. He's done uh, some great things at uh, Arizona State. And to his credit, again, he was there before Michael Crow was there. And not only did he survive Michael Crow, but Michael singled him out and moved him up through the ranks to the position of provost where he has been working with Michael now for quite some time. And he's gonna talk about their strategic plan, their efforts, and uh, their uh, excitement, and he's going to show us, which he can do handily, his strategic plan, which I'm very excited to share with all of you. So without taking any longer, because I'd like uh, Mark to have as much time as he can, to let's please welcome him here today. Thank you, Domenico. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm so impressed to see so many people on a Friday morning. Uh, I thought it was just going to be Domenico and I, but the, <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and uh, as promised, uh, uh, I will share you, with you our strategic plan. Uh, and I'm holding it. Okay. This is the entire strategic plan of Arizona State University. And I'll talk about this. but. That has been very important. I worked actually for a provost, Milt Glick. Some of you uh, may have known Milt uh, left ASU after I was at uh, uh, Wayne State for a long time and then uh, came to ASU and uh, uh, then was president of the University of Nevada, Reno, just before he passed away. And uh, uh, Milt believed that uh, every strategic plan should, admit, should fit in your breast pocket because otherwise you'd never remember what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so we have tried to actually uh, keep it pretty focused because uh, it's really hard to accomplish much if you are too, too broad or too expansive for people to keep a focus of what you're really trying to do. And so th this is very important, this slide, because it says a new American university. Sometimes people talk about ASU as the new American university. That's never been our intent. 
Our intent has always been to convey that we believe there needs to be other models of higher education in the United States and that we're simply trying to build a different model and that there should be lots of different models and that we shouldn't be hung up and all trying to be like Ivy Leagues or that we should all try and be uh, based on exclusion. Um, in fact, if you read David Brooks's article in the New York Times, I think it's out this morning, um, and uh, David was our commencement speaker last uh, May and uh, uh, sent me the article yesterday to, to read, and uh, uh, needless to say, I was really happy because we got some nice kudos from him, but, uh, the, but his point is that, is that if, if you're just simply trying to figure out the way to be the most exclusive institution you want to be, it's actually pretty easy. It's like when my governing board asks, well, how do you, you know, be more successful in retention? I said, well, the short answer is I cut off the bottom 2,000 of the freshman class. Not, not a problem. You want me to raise the retention rate? I can do that overnight. That won't get us where we want to go in terms of actually helping our community achieve what it needs to achieve. It won't help us reach the students who are otherwise excluded. But if you just want a higher retention number and show how exclusive we are, I can do that. And, and a lot of universities use a lot of gimmicks in this space. I learned a lot years ago when my youngest, who's now a PhD himself, uh, but is uh, in his early 30s, and uh, he was looking at Johns Hopkins for his freshman year. So we're at the Homewood campus in Baltimore, and we take the tour, and uh, then there's the Q&A, and uh, someone asked something about grades or something. And uh, they were quick to say, well, as freshmen, uh, you don't get any grades in your first semester. You only get pass-fail at Johns Hopkins, because they're not going to lose any students that they bring in in their first semester. And if they figure if they don't lose them in their first semester, they'll be back likely for the second and for subsequent years. And that's, that's true. They have about a 95% graduation rate of their first year class. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go on in this space. Uh, at Columbia University, my president's uh, former employer, uh, I think only Columbia College is counted in their retention rate. They don't count every student. Uh, so uh, when you think about these things, realize that to some degree people are always trying to determine how best to present themselves, not always how to best to achieve what they need to achieve. Or for what they want to achieve, it works fine. Is it the up arrow or the down arrow? Down arrow, Thank you. <laughs> so the biggest thing we had to do was change the culture of the institution. Because the culture of the institution, as you'll see in a few more slides, was really something that was very psychologically dependent on what happened at the state of Arizona. So as the state of Arizona legislature made decisions, so went Arizona State University. And that was, you know, we also had to point out to people that seemed really strange that we would become like that. Because ASU has a different history than most public universities. ASU was born out of a referendum led by the president of then Arizona State Teachers College, Grady Gamage. And over the objections of the state legislature, the Board of Regents, and the governor, got enough signatures to put the issue on the ballot in 1958 to vote whether or not the college should become Arizona State University, and they overwhelmingly won. So here we were, born out of that kind of history, and yet here we were many years later, still kind of sitting there like this, waiting for the state legislature to do something that would result in something we could then do. It seemed like the wrong mindset for us to really advance aggressively. And so we had to work on culture change. And the president was very, very aware of this. And so starting with his inaugural address, he spoke about a broad vision of inclusion. He spoke about a broad vision of achievement and a broad vision of excellence. It wasn't captured as neatly as it is today, but it was all there, the con constituent parts. In fact, uh, Frank, former president of Cornell, 
Thank you. Frank Rhodes' book from 2004. If you read Frank Rhodes' book, you will see a lot of the things that influenced Michael in terms of building what is now considered what we call a new American university. Um, just, and I remember talking to Frank about this. And I said, so Frank, when you were at Cornell, you never did any of these things that you think universities should do. And he said, yeah, because Cornell was a made institution. There was no way they would entertain change. And, but that's not really going to be the solution for most of us going forward, and especially those of us in the public sphere, because those of us in the public sphere really have a different commitment. We're born of what Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote in 1762, the social contract. And our contract is not with the government. Our contract is with the people. The people we're supposed to educate, the people we're supposed to help, and so how do we change a culture so we're building that kind of social contract, not a social contract that is worried about whether the state legislature votes X or Y? And the state legislature over time has, of course, helped that very much because in Arizona, the three universities 10 years ago were receiving, the three public universities were receiving about $1.1 billion in uh, total state investment, and today it's about 700 million, and at Arizona State University, that means we get about 9% of our total funding from the state legislature. So we basically don't really care anymore what the state legislature does, <laughs> because we run on $3.4 billion, and you know, 9% is important, nobody wants to give up $300 million, but you, you gotta treat it more as that, that's the, that's like having an eight or nine billion dollar endowment and that's the derivative of the endowment and that's very nice. They give us the money, we're thankful to get it. We, if, we, if they'll give us more, we'll certainly ask, but we don't make any of our plans based on how the state government goes and nobody at the institution thinks about them. When I first arrived there, people said, well, I'm on a state funded line. <laughs> now they tell me that, I said, really? I said, maybe you're on a student funded line, but you're certainly not on a state funded line. Um, so we set out to, to really change the culture. And a culture is, of course, a set of assumptions. It's a set of beliefs. It's, it's how we perceive and think about what we are. And we had to change that mindset. Um, some of you are familiar with Carol Dweck's work on mindset for students. She talks about a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And a fixed mindset is like you hit this constraint or this barrier. You don't know how to navigate through it. You don't know how to move to be successful. And a growth mindset is someone who has the, has the same kind of barrier or constraint but understands how they could do something to, to work their way through it. And so we had to build an institution that had a growth mindset. It's not just about students, it's also about the organization. And so we then had to change the culture. And this is a lot of heavy lifting. But not only to, to achieve this, it can't rest only on the president, or in your case, the chancellor. That you get an idea, the, the, the projection comes, but each one of us as leaders within the institution, all the way down, had to carry the message. We had to drive it constantly. We still do to this day. There isn't a point in time when I stand, I go to every academic senate meeting, and contrary to what people sometimes think about ASU, it's not all top down. The faculty senate vote on everything. Um, and sometimes we get into arguments with the faculty senate, just like at every institution. And, uh, but when we're talking about the university, we're always referencing this. Because if we can't find solutions that help us advance this, then we don't have a solution. The solution is how are we going to advance the plan that we've identified, the goals that we've set out? What is it that we're doing? What is it that you're doing that contributes to those kinds of things? So this led to the development of the ASU Charter. And now we did not have a charter when we were created. And it was basically go out and do good things in 1958. Uh, nobody really had a vision as to what would distinguish Arizona State University from any other university. And so this is something that we now uh, strongly believe in. ASU is a comprehensive public research university. 
measured not by whom it excludes, but by whom it includes and how they succeed, advancing research and discovery of public value. This is very important, of public value. It's not that we don't believe in basic research. It's not that we don't have lots of basic scientists and, and, and humanists doing uh, work, et cetera, at the, at the very granular levels, but that we as an institution have a responsibility to help advance the public benefit. And assuming fundamental responsibility for the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities it serves. Communities for us is a global notion. It's not just Arizona. It's not just the Phoenix metro area. I was telling your chancellor that we now have offices in Vietnam where we have about 10 staff. In fact, it's an engineering initiative we've been doing in Vietnam where Intel came to us and said, they have their largest chip manufacturing facility in, and their headquarters are in uh, uh, Metro Phoenix. And they make a chip in Phoenix that they ship to Vietnam for some processing that gets shipped back to, for finalized in, in Tempe, Arizona, or Gilbert or Chandler, one of the suburban towns. And uh, they said the engineering quality in Vietnam was not at the level we need. How can you help us as an institution? You've got a great engineering program. Well, that's a big, tall order. And how are you going to do that? So we started thinking about it. We, of course, sent some people over just to find out what the state of things were in Vietnam. And over a course of about two years, we said we worked with Intel, the USAID, and the government of Vietnam. And together, those three organizations put together $40 million for us to train the faculty in the schools of engineering in Vietnam to upgrade the quality of the faculty so that they could produce better outcomes with the students. Because you would never get anywhere in Vietnam if all we did was send everybody to ASU or to American institutions to get training. You would never help the country. The country would have just this you know, band of people but never really get what it needs to do. And so we're still on that project. We've got another couple years to go. Two of those schools have now achieved ABET accreditation. Working for two more, ABET is the Saquinon of engineering education. Uh, and working with two more to achieve that level. But now the government of Vietnam is talking to us about what we can do to help them in nursing, what we can help them in, in tourism, and a variety of other things. And so it's led to an awful lot of opportunity. But we also have offices in Moscow where we run a training facility because we took over the Thunderbird School of Global Management. It was a nonprofit that after 70 years was going to go bankrupt and so we absorbed it. And uh, uh, we have uh, some training offices in uh, G Geneva. We have an office in Dubai. We have offices in Tokyo and Seoul and I forget everywhere else. But at any rate, so but when we think about communities, we don't just think about Arizona. But Arizona is very important because at the same point, we just got a gift from a family in Arizona, the Watts family, that's W-A-T-T-S. And uh, neither of them went to college. They both grew up in the Phoenix area. And they started a uh, equipment rental business. And if I remember correctly, it was like small equipment, like lawnmowers and other kinds of handheld tools and so forth. And they built this business and built this business and ultimately built it into, I think, eight or ten states, a uh, multi-million dollar enterprise, and um, uh, sold the business uh, just a few years ago. And uh, we're very impressed with what was going on at Arizona State University, and they wanted to contribute to their community. And so they saw a vehicle through the university and so our College of Public Service and Community Solutions, which is schools like social work, uh, com uh, community resources and development, which subsumes uh, recreation, tourism, things like that, um, criminology, criminal justice, public policy, are all housed in that college. And so they made a $30 million naming gift to the college. And, uh, uh, and one of the first things we decided to do as part of the, the gift was reflective of who we were receiving the gift from. So they grew up in a small part of Phoenix called Maryvale, which when it was built post-World War II was a great little suburban community that had fallen into terrible condition, 
had been uh, uh, had lots of crime and other kinds of issues with it, et cetera. And so we are devoting all of our energies right now to helping that community. And we have brought together the police and a variety of other social agencies all to work with us. And we're there for the long haul. This is not a research project per se. This is a long-term community development initiative. And uh, now it's also funding other things, some new professorships and some other kinds of things. But it's very important that we advance that kind of work. So we are very much committed to this in every way that we can. And we work tirelessly to, to do this. And so what you see in here, when you, and I'll, I've left a copy with uh, your chancellor, and, and I'll leave a few more. But the, uh, uh, and it's on our website, needless to say. Uh, <laughs> but we have uh, four goals. Demonstrate leadership in academic excellence and accessibility. So it's not just to be an either or situation. We're not about only providing for more students to go to college and be successful in going to college, but also for being a leading research institution within the institution, or within the state and within the country. And for the last 10 years, we have been the fastest growing research institution in the United States despite the fact in the last 10 years, our student enrollment has gone from roughly, probably, well, maybe, maybe it's been a little longer time period, but it's about 50,000 to now between, uh, on our campus, on our four campuses in the metro area, we have 75,000, and then we teach another 50,000 online. We do not have a separate faculty for online. We have one faculty. One faculty delivers the same quality, delivers the same content, and ensures that what we deliver is top drawer for every student, no matter the modality in which they get, engage with us to learn. And that's very important. So, and we don't, I should tell you this, that when we started online 10 years ago, we never said you must. We have, to this day, have never said you must. We have now 202 programs online but we have never told a single unit that they must put anything up online. About five years ago, electrical engineering came to us and said, we're ready, we want to put something online. Okay, how are we going to do this? So we figured it out, we figured out with them how to build an electrical engineering program online that would withstand ABET accreditation and that has all the labs and all the other requirements that go with it. We've done it, we've been reviewed by ABET, we're successful, we're running it. We have about 1,000 students in that program. Uh, biology came to us two, three years ago and said, we think we're ready to put biology up online. Well, we were very excited about this because we really didn't have a basic science program online because we knew the challenges of doing that. And, but they figured it out. And so we work with various other companies and so forth. We work with a company out of Denmark called Labster. We work with uh, Google and with another company, I'm forgetting their name, um, to build the labs. And the labs can be done in either two dimensions or three dimensions. And about a quarter of the students elect to do it with the goggles and do it in uh, virtual reality. And uh, about 75% choose not to do it that way. Uh, mostly because they're, they're just not comfortable with it. And remember that all our online students, our average age of our online students is in their early 30s, and the average age, of course, on campus is what you would expect, 18, 19, 20, so forth. And so, and they're working adults and so forth online. They're not uh, nearly as uh, uh, interested in the gimmick as they are in the degree and uh, getting themselves where they want to go. Uh, but the students who do it with virtual reality actually speak of it even more highly than the students who do it in two dimensions. So the point is that we try and drive all this and all our goals, no matter what it is we're doing, but we do not give up on research while we're trying to do education. We don't say that research takes a back seat. It doesn't. It's as important to us as achieving in uh, the education realm in student success. So. Uh, that started when uh, Laddie Coor was our president. So Laddie Coor had been the president of the University of Vermont, came to ASU in about 1990, and uh, 
1997, I was a dean, and I remember Laddie gathering us, and we had about $40 million maybe in external research funding. And he said, we're going to triple research funding in the next four years. And we all looked around the room thinking, who was he talking to? <laughs> Couldn't have been me. Uh, <laughs> my college only had about $2 million in research funding. I, <laughs> he's got the wrong guy. Uh, but Laddie was insistent. He laid it out. He said, we cannot serve our students optimally unless we are also pushing the edge of knowledge. And four years later, we were about $125 million in research funding because it changed our mindset. So I was now, when I was giving positions to my uh, units for recruiting, I was looking carefully at who they were recruiting. Are we recruiting people who have the potential or who have a history of achieving externally funded research so that they can help support students, employ students, help drive knowledge, do the kinds of things that we want to do? In our little college, about $2 million of research funding went to $15 million. Well, that's a long way from you know, engineering and basic science. But for us, that was like remarkable because I was the dean of social work and uh, yeah, recreation and uh, uh, what else did I have? Uh, gerontology and uh, criminal justice and a uh, few other units. And uh, we weren't exactly known for our big grants. Uh, and then when Michael came in, Michael you know, was also thought of as a science guy, science and engineering guy. And a lot of faculty didn't think he really cared much about the social sciences or humanities. It's actually not true. First of all, he is a public policy PhD uh, from the Maxwell School in, at Syracuse. And, um, but he knew that he had to make investments in a variety of places. So he helped launch with an investment of, I think, about $600,000, uh, our Center for Religion and Conflict, which has gone on to be very successful. And they bring in lots of externally funded grants. I mean, not at the scale of engineering and, and uh, biology, but lots of externally funded grants to examine these kinds of issues. Because it turns out, people like the Department of Defense are really interested in understanding what issues underscore religion and conflict. It's not just a, a, an academic question. It, it's, it makes difference, ultimately, in shaping public policy. And uh, then he got a $10 million gift from the Virginia Piper Foundation, which is a local foundation in, in Arizona. And they gave the president the opportunity to spend it where he wanted. So he put all $10 million in creating the Virginia Piper Creative Writing Center. And we have the number four or five creative writing program in the country. So you, know, you have to balance everything in, in what we're trying to do. But we do work on that. So, we had that goal, establish leadership in academic excellence and accessibility, establish national standing in academic quality and impact of colleges and schools in every field, establish ASU as a leading global center for interdisciplinary research, discovery, development, um, and enhance our local impact and social embeddedness. And those are the four goals, and there's some things underneath each one of them, that drive our overall operation. So for example, one of the goals that directly affects me is that I have to achieve by 20, it says 2025, but in Michael's world that means 2020, uh, uh, retention of 90%. Now I'm going to show you where we are in retention, and you'll see what's, what's changed there. But, but that's a big lift. Moving retention of first year students is an enormous challenge, because they come with all kinds of challenges and issues themselves. So, you, uh, can you just tell everybody where you can find this charter on campus? Oh, uh, at ASU? Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, Domenico. So uh, if you are on any one of our four campuses at ASU, we have a downtown campus, the Tempe campus, Polytechnic campus, and our West campus. Uh, no matter which campus you're on, you will find this in granite in a monument that is about the size of that screen uh, on all four campuses. And people who think Michael's come to ASU for the next step, wrong. He's been there for 17 years. He's not leaving. Uh, he believes in the presidents who served for 25 and 30 years 
in the, especially you saw that in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s in, in the United States, because they really were able to transform institutions. And that's what his commitment is, is to transform ASU, which he has largely done. And I do really believe today, because if you look at the faculty, since 2002, probably 70% of the faculty have come since Michael arrived. You know, numbers retire, people move on, et cetera, new people come. People are coming, eyes wide open, this is what ASU is about. And so the chances of erosion of that are very small. But you have to have persistence. Just like you're trying to encourage students' persistence, you have to be persistent in driving this. We're conscious of this all the time because we as faculty, including myself, it's easy to slide back and think of the way things used to be <laughs> and think well, that'd be so much easier. And that's what we have to constantly defend against. And so we are always on this. By the way, this brochure we send out to every employee every employee, faculty and staff, once or twice a year. Just to remind them, that's why we're here. So we also had to change the mindset, as I was saying. This is derivative of some of Mike's work, actually, on public policy. And thinking about the different models that exist in higher ed or could exist in higher education. Now, we all have actually some pieces of some of the, of all of them, but what he was trying to make the point is the academy model, you know, which is, think of it as the Harvard or the, the you know, the, the small Ivy, the small liberal arts college, the Oberlin's, those kinds of things. That's great. They do a great job. It's not about criticizing what they do. It's just that it's a different model. And it's about exclusion. The state control model is really, you know, where we were waiting for the state to say yes, no, give you money, won't give you money, et cetera, et cetera, and moving away from that. The market model is the for-profits, and that's the, all they're concerned about is profit maximization, right? Through, they don't care about whether anybody graduates. They only care about enrollment. So as long as you enroll, they're making money. And if you don't graduate, it doesn't really matter because they'll just get more students to enroll. We believe we're in the enterprise model where our animating purpose is social transformation. And this is the mindset that we have been driving to, is how do we as an institution treat ourselves as an enterprise, a social enterprise? We are there to impact the quality of life, the quality of the community, and the success of our students through the work that we do. That means allowing faculty a lot of opportunity, so the knowledge entrepreneurs plays out in lots of ways. We have probably the most generous uh, policy for faculty who invent and license products of any institution. Faculty member gets either 50 or 60 percent of the revenue for a product that gets licensed that they invented. Their lab gets another 20 percent, and the university gets about 20 or 25 percent. I can't remember the exact numbers, but we take a very small portion because we want to incentivize that behavior. We want faculty to be contributing and driving and spinning off com companies. And we have, in the last 15 years or so, spun off well over 100 companies. And those hundreds of companies have now generated all kinds of venture capital bringing in to the state, creating jobs, which then see positions Arizona State University in the mind's eye of the people of Arizona as a contributor to their well-being in different ways than just our education. And so we have been working toward that, and we continue to work toward that. That's a constant challenge to drive that kind of mindset of being an enterprise. It's not about profit. It's simply about being outside the notion of being controlled by somebody else, that we control our own destiny, that we drive our destiny, we decide what we're going to do, we organize ourselves in that way, and we drive for success. So we also have metrics. And our board set these metrics. They like to think of it as their spider diagram. Mm -hmm. um, and so while the board did set these metrics, they were mostly set in response to what we said we thought we could do. Uh, so you can see in the, uh, I should tell you that I'm mostly colorblind. So if I get something wrong, you'll understand. But 
I'm trying, so I, I do this mostly by memory, uh, but I believe it's yellow uh, is the inside uh, color. And that's where we were when we uh, started looking at this in 8, 9. And then you see the next band is where we are about a year ago, a uh, year and a half ago, and then the outside band is where we need to go. And uh, it's extraordinarily uh, helpful because it just constantly reminds the leadership that we have to be mindful of how we're going to get there and pay attention. And because someone's asking us. So you see that research number, $815 million. We do not have a medical school at Arizona State University. We do not have an ag school at Arizona State University. The land grant is the University of Arizona in Tucson. They have the med school and the ag school. We're only about, well, our last year, our, when the herd rankings come out in research expenditures the, from the, the year ending this past June, we should be about $640 million in research expenditures. The University of Arizona, with the med school and the ag school, will be probably under $700 million. So we are closing the gap from where we were. And remember, in 2002, we were only about $125 million. So from 2002 to 2019, $640 million. And we've been taking more students, educating more students, and educating them with more success. We did not sacrifice who we took or how they succeeded for driving the research mission. You can do both. It takes an incredible amount of effort and commitment, but you can do both. And it's not like my tenured faculty are overburdened by their teaching loads. I have to pause there. It drives me crazy when we talk about teaching in terms of load, because research is never talked about that way. Teaching has every negative connotation you can attach to it. It's a load, it's somehow, uh, you know, something that you're carrying, like this, right? Uh, research is an opportunity. Uh, and so, um, I had a faculty member come, at ASU, everybody who holds an academic appointment, uh, whether you're an administrator like myself, or you're uh, obviously a faculty member, you have to teach. I teach every fall, I teach Wednesday afternoons uh, from uh, three to six, I teach a, a doctoral seminar course, Michael teaches in the spring semester. He teaches a master's uh, course in public policy. Uh, and all of our deans teach, and all of anybody who holds an academic administration job teaches. Because we believe everybody in the academic side of the house is a teacher scholar, which means that they are committed to both teaching and scholarship. I'm also expected to continue to keep my research up. So, fortunately, I work with some good people because if it was only me, I probably wouldn't be a nearly very productive, but we get out about, through our team, probably about at least two to three refereed publications a year. We just did a whole study gathering data from 800 subjects, and now trying to figure out what to make of all that. Uh, but we drive all these things. Mike has a new book coming out, which if I could remember the title, I'd tell you. But <laughs> so don't show him the video. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it is uh, coming out in April, a uh, successor to the previous book he wrote. And all that takes time and energy to do those kinds of things, but it's really important because if I'm going to lead the faculty, I also have to live the life of faculty. And faculty have to see that, and we really believe that. You have to walk the talk. And so all this plays in everything we do. So you can see where, you know, roughly where we are, and, uh, uh, you know, kind of where we're supposed to be, ultimately. So, who we include is really very important to us. Because we talk about inclusion, and that means you've got to walk the talk. That you have to demonstrate that you are actually being inclusive, not just rhetorically committed to it. And so, the volume of students is one thing. But the diversity of the students is also a huge thing for us. And so we have changed dramatically. As you can see, the majority population here shows at 53.2%, uh, and in 2009 it was 65.7%. And so the, the, the diversity continues to increase. What I will tell you 
is that these numbers are a year old, and they're we're even more diverse because for the last three years in a row, our first year student class, our what well, we we're trying to move away from the term freshman because of the gender associated with the term and it doesn't exist for sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So our first year students, if the of the students from Arizona, 52% are students of color, which in Arizona is predominantly Hispanic students. And overall, including our, all of our students, our first year class is 46% students of color. So the student body is absolutely reflective today of the people we represent, of the state in which we're located. We need to move the faculty to be more diverse, but the student body is definitely moving that direction. The other part is if you're going to be inclusive, it talks, we're committed to socioeconomic uh, inclusion because that actually addresses a lot of the issues around race and ethnicity and so forth because of the way income is distributed in the country. And so you can see the change. The yellow bars are the most current. And you can see where we have come in enrollment with students from families less than $20,000 in income, $40,000, $60,000 in income. And so we have dramatically increased our commitment to students at the low end of the socioeconomic spectrum. And so how do we do that? Well, Arizona, unfortunately, is one of five or six states in the United States that has no state-based financial aid. None. I assume there is in Michigan, some form of state-based, just a little. Okay. Sorry, you're in the same boat then. Um, so we set aside 17% of our tuition dollars for, for student financial aid. Practically, that means we're spending about 21% of our uh, stu uh, tuition dollars on student financial aid. And so this year, I have spent about $450 million on need-based aid. Okay. And that's because every kid who comes to Arizona whose family earns less than, I think, $46,000, I think that's the Pell level in Arizona, will get eight, and if they're fully qualified for admission to the university, they will get eight semesters of tuition, room, board, books, and 20 hours a week of employment on campus for the eight semesters. And we guarantee that for every student, plus they're all assigned a mentor. I even have Michael mentors at least two students every year. You can only imagine what those conversations are like, but Michael mentors those two <laughs> students. There's no chance that they are unsuccessful. Uh, <laughs> um, and yes, we're happy to have these families from over $400,000 in income because they can actually pay the tuition. <laughs> now, some people might think that tuition is the best regulator of access. And I'm here to tell you that that's a pile of bunk. We have conveyed that to various politicians who ask us from time to time about free tuition. I think if you want to devalue the university education, the fastest way to do that is to make it free. You only need to look at places like the University of Paris. Uh, and because free doesn't make sense, why are these people at this end of the scale getting free education? Why would I get free education? I can pay for my kids. I'm well paid. I appreciate being well paid, but there's really no reason why I should get a free education for my kids. I have to contribute. If taxation is to be progressive, I don't know why tuition wouldn't be somewhat progressive. And so for us, in 2002, when Michael became president, our <coughs> tuition for nine months was $2,400. And our tuition today is just shy of $11,000. And at $11,000, we're the cheapest tuition in the, in the state of Arizona. The other two uni public universities are more expensive than we are. And we have a 10-year commitment that we will not increase in-state undergraduate tuition by more than 3% for 10 years. 
And we had that commitment for the last seven years. We renewed it for another 10. And for the last seven years, our average has been about 1.6%. Now, we do increase it for out-of-state, and we do increase it for international. And we do have a large international student body because we are the number one public university for international students in the United States, about 13,000 and change. And so they're very important, but you can't run the university entirely on your international students either. Uh, but we do make this commitment, and we're going to continue to live by it. And is it difficult? It's unbelievably difficult. But then you have to decide what's, where's your commitment, what's important. So we also had to change the university to think like a student-centric organization instead of a faculty-centric organization. So when I was a faculty member, as far as I was concerned, the world really revolved around me. And I was quite happy to think about it that way. And it worked really well for me. Uh, when I taught, what I taught, et cetera, I should be the determinants of all this. I was basically just lending my talents to the university, and they could pay me in return. Um, and, uh, and I have to say that that's, you know, that's the way I was as a faculty member. Uh, but it comes to the realization that, hey, if we're going to be successful, we have to think about the student, not just about ourselves. That doesn't mean we don't want the faculty to be successful. We have an incredible infrastructure to help faculty be successful. But for example, when you schedule classes, that has to meet the student needs, not the faculty needs. And then to make sure that you schedule classes so the students can get the courses they need to graduate on time. So we make a commitment to every student at Arizona State University, every undergraduate, that if they need a class, it will be available in the semester they need it. We just had nine students turned away by the federal government at the LAX, Chinese students, for reasons we're still trying to find out. These were all returning students who were not permitted to come back to finish their degree. Now, we could have just, you know, doing what we are doing, stomping our feet, writing letters and, you know, protesting and doing all that. But we also reached out to every one of those students. We have those who wished, which was about six of the nine, are continuing to be enrolled through ASU Online. But one of them, if you can believe how pernicious this decision was, was nine credit hours away from finishing his degree, was coming back for one semester to finish the degree. And we didn't have any of those nine credit hours available online. So the faculty are all teaching that student by old-fashioned correspondence. They've developed the content, and they're working with the student, so the student will graduate this December. But you have to decide that you're really focused on the student in order to drive the institution. And that doesn't mean taking away from research. You have to kind of have both spheres of the head working at the same time. And it's hard, but we try and do that. Now, how else have we been student-centric? So we had to align our online, or at least we thought we should. So we decided to align our online scheduling of course availability with our face-to-face -face uh, course uh, uh, schedule. So we offer uh, online six <laughs> starts a year. And in, for face-to-face, -face, what that meant was that the fall semester, that the face-to-face -face student could now take a class over the traditional 15-week fall semester, which we call fall C, the letter C, or faculty, faculty love this, you could schedule the class in fall A and teach in the first seven and a half weeks. It's six hours of contact a week, not three hours, but it's doable. We have faculty who do it. Or you could teach in the second seven and a half weeks in fall B, as long as those schedules were going to work ultimately to serve students, and that's what a department chair or whatever was responsible for figuring out, then you could do that. And faculty thought this was terrific because, and remember, these are the same faculty who are teaching online. So faculty members say, great, I'm going to teach an online course in the first seven and a half weeks. And I'm going to teach a face-to-face -face course in the second seven and a half weeks. I'm meeting my requirement to teach two courses, if that's my, my teaching assignment, for the fall semester. But I am only teaching one at a time, and I have more time to do my research. The 
the lecturers, our non-tenure track faculty or clinical faculty, love it because they get to distribute their workload differently. And so it works for a lot of people, but it also works for students. And importantly, that's who it was designed for. So when we talk about retention, I have to step down because I can't see that. <laughs> but you can see way back in 1996, we were in the 75% range. We went down and up, et cetera. But if you look at the blue dotted line, it is blue, right, the low line? Okay. okay. Uh, the uh, blue dotted line is what the trend would have been like in retention had we basically done nothing. And it would have meant that we would have, we might have hit, not necessarily would have, but we might have hit 90% retention in 2033. It's a long time. <laughs> Through the interventions, which are the ones at the bottom, and there's more than what are represented here, but these are some of them, we have been going, and you can see nothing is a straight line. You know, they're students, things happen. Recessions happen, screws things up entirely. Um, but you can see for our in-state students, we're now at 88.5%. And for our overall population, we're at 86.8. And in the last three years, we're up almost 3%. And this is a deliberate effort to do this. We exclude nobody from the count. We have institutions, one of my sister institutions in the state, uh, enrolls students who are at the low end for 11 credit hours, because you know you have to be in 12 credit hours to be counted in the cohort. So they enroll them for 11, and then they have the community college come on campus and teach them for three hours and enroll them in the three hours in the community college so they don't have to have them in the cohort and magically their retention rate goes up because those students were never counted in the first place. If you want no tricks, I can tell you just about everything that's going on in the nation about that. But this is what we're trying to do, is to drive this. And you know, in the one year where you see this trough where we dropped to 80 and 83.7, well, we were trying something that year and did not work. <laughs> but, you know, if you don't try things, you never know whether or not it's, it's going to work. And so we also don't spend enormous amounts of time pre-testing things. One of the questions I got at the Regents meeting was, well, how do you know everything works here? And I said, well, I don't. <laughs> I only know the cumulative effect. Because I can't take the time to run an experiment and randomly assign students to one treatment and, not the, and, the, and leave the other treatment un, you know, with not, no intervention. And when that might impact the student's retention. And so what am I doing? I'm depriving some students of a service that would advance them while I'm testing this to see if it works. Now we do run natural experiments sometimes where we will allow students to opt in or opt out if they wish, just so we can get some idea. We did this with this program called LEAD right near the bottom. And I would tell you what it stands for, but I rarely remember. I know it's learn, explore, something, something. <laughs> and, uh, um, and that's designed for the students at the bottom of their preparedness range when they come to ASU. And for us, that's right now about 1,000 students, maybe 1,100. But we started with about 200, and we allowed students to opt in and who wanted to try it. And we found out just from the natural experiment that we saw dramatic gains in retention. Now, there's a lot of variables there that you can't account for when you're doing opt-in, opt-out. But it gave us hope that this thing could be positive, and it has. It's been instrumental in lifting our uh, overall retention. We never thought ASU 101, which is the only thing we did in 07, so we know for sure it works. <laughs> ASU, ASU 101 is one credit class, introduction to the university. Every student must take it. Every unit must teach it. It has some common content, and then they can customize content in the, in the units. And it is remarkable. I've taught it myself. And it is remarkable to stand there in front of the students and talk about things, about study habits, talk about the return on their investment that they're getting out of their education, to really help focus them, even to talk about the college they were in and see, here are all the opportunities for them within the college that they had no idea of what was actually in the college. They knew where they were a major of X. 
that's it. They didn't necessarily even know they were in college. And then you start talking about all the research centers, the undergraduate student research opportunities, the study abroad things, the compressed study abroad we run. You know, study abroad went up enormously at ASU, not because we got a lot of kids who can afford to go away for a semester, because quite the opposite, most kids can't. I think it's one of the great myths of US higher education, actually, is that every kid somehow goes to college and they spend a semester abroad. I think that's it's great in the movies, but it's pretty rare, actually. I mean, if you think of ASU with 75,000 students, and well, this was about five years ago, so maybe we were like 68,000 students, and we had like 1,200 kids who would go on a traditional study abroad. And today, it's around 2,500 students because we offer these 10-day study abroad trips. And so it provides them with an opportunity to go within a semester and not have to pay extra costs that they would otherwise for other kinds of things and not sacrifice work opportunities and so on. And so that has given them a taste of things. So we had students go to Greece and spend 10 days at the height of the uh, uh, exodus of uh, Syrians who were uh, uh, as refugees coming into Greece and to work with those refugees for 10 days. What an eye-opening experience for kids who mostly have never been outside of uh, Arizona. We have a very parochial group of students within the, within the state. They, they don't travel much. Their students, it's not unusual I suppose, but we have lots of students who've never seen the Grand Canyon and that's only four hours away. <laughs> so. Uh, so we have to find ways to help nurture this. And then graduation rate, which is the real sci qui non of success, is really what we're driving toward. So what you see is that on the four-year graduation rate, we're almost at 52%. At the uh, uh, in-state students, we're at about 68%. And actually, this we're now, in the most recent data, we're over 70% for in-state students, 71% to be exact. And the top line is actually eight years out the, using the VSA rate. In other words, finding where students are in other institutions. Because students leave us and they go to other institutions, they still graduate. And so finding out where they are as well. So then the other thing is making an impact in terms of student success. So here what this shows you is, let me explain it very quickly. The very low means the risk level. So meaning these are kids who are going to get high. If you're in the very low, you've got a high likelihood of success. It's for your family background, your grades, all these kinds of things. You're, you're in great shape. If you're very high, you're a very marginal student for whom there is a lot of issues and that you may be withdrawing, quitting, any number of things going on. So just look at the very high category, and you can see that in the Pell, non-Pell, back in 2001, 2002, and then you can see that what's going on today. Now, the gap has gotten bigger, which concerns us, but the gain has been substantial for uh, the Pell eligible students. And so that's what we're working for. And you can see in the high category, our non-Pell are now below our Pell recipients in terms of uh, success. And so this is just trying to point out that we are trying to make that leap to improve student success irrespective of student background. Someone give me a high sign. How many minutes do I have? <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> what would you like? <laughs> We're a little bit over. Okay. So we'll, we'll, let, me, let me get to the end game here quickly. Uh, and I'm, all these slides are being left, so you'll have them all, et cetera. But, um, this is just to make the point that we use technology constantly to help drive what we do. We could not be successful without using technology. We have about 130 or 140 technology partners. We build some of our own technology. Uh, for example, we wanted to have a uh, scheduling software for advising that was pan-university, and it's mostly because of our size and complexity. We could not buy a product off the shelf. We've tried for four years. So we're now building our own. Uh, we have this e-advisor system, which helps students track on their own how they're making progress toward their degree. That helps keep them on track. This has been instrumental in driving graduation rates. Everything is student-centric again, trying to see what's really going on with the student and making sure their advisors know exactly what they're looking at. Their persistence outlook, which is 
this is, talks about is really a lot of big data analytics. We run a model every night that has about 800 variables in it and on our first year class. And if there's any change in the risk of the student uh, withdrawing or failing, there's an intervention the next day. And so we have a mobile app now for all our students that does more than wayfinding. It gives them all kinds of information. And it's, it's been incredibly popular with students. They really much prefer everything through the mobile app. We have Sunny, ASU's chatbot. We didn't know how this was going to go, but it turns out students actually like interacting with the chatbot more than they do us. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, OK. Uh, so Sunny is you know, programmed to provide a lot of standard answers to questions. And it does save and make us more efficient. At the same time, the students like it because they just get a quick answer and they can move on. I, it's maybe my generation might be not very intuitive, but trust me, it's a big seller. We now use it all the way through the first year experience. Um, and so in, in uh, adaptive and active learning, we have done all of our uh, introductory courses, the gateway courses where students typically fail and uh, uh, find uh, uh, real challenges. And you can see here that we are constantly looking to improve. And I'll just start with the, the bottom one, college algebra, where we used to have, a, a, in the lecture format, 69% would pass, 38% got a B or better. Since we went to adaptive and active learning, 84% pass, and 71% have a B or better. And you can see that even in the low placement score, even the kids who come in who have the least likelihood of actually being successful in college algebra, 74% are now passing and 46% with a B or better. And we do not teach any remedial math anymore. We teach no remedial courses. Because in adaptive math, we use a program called Alex, which is, also has a smart tutor built around it. And so the student is automatically remediated within class all the way back down to the eighth grade level, if necessary, to rebuild the skill. Talking about student-centric, we said to ourselves, well, kids fail math. And it, math is probably the single most predictive uh, uh, course they can take for their ultimate success. But you know, they fail, they get to December, and they can't get through the math. So then we asked ourselves, well, why does the course have to end? It was great when Carnegie decided this in the turn of the 20th century in 1900 that we were going to have, you know, this kind of uh, 15 weeks and three hours a week and everything else. But we said to ourselves, why? So now when students are in college algebra and they get to December, if they haven't finished the course, they get a Z grade which is we've been using for PhD students for eons, which is the students who are continuously enrolled in their dissertation credits. And so we just used it for our, our first year students in college algebra. They get a Z grade and they continue into the next semester. And they can finish in January, February, March, April, or May. And it drives much greater success. Students persist. Students like what they're doing. They feel rewarded by it. And they understand, and we understand, students learn in different ways. So we've done all that. We also went to digital portfolios. So, students. Yeah. Financially, how do you deal with that? Do you charge them credits? They we don't charge they, them again in the spring semester. Okay. No. So, in uh, the digital portfolios, are uh, this is students put together all their work. One of the biggest challenges we all have is we all go through accreditation. Accreditation all, and we have the same accrediting body, HLC, and they all want direct evidence of student learning. And we typically have surveys and other kinds of things, or we have individual courses that are somehow proxies for this, et cetera. Digital portfolios allows us to put things in there, and we can actually randomly sample and see against course objectives and degree objectives whether students are demonstrating the kind of knowledge they're supposed to have from their uh, digital portfolios. Um, this just tells you that it's cheaper for us to run than it is most of the institutions in, uh, who are Research One institutions. Uh, research, I told you about this already, and we use this slide just to rub it in a little. Uh, uh, <laughs> but we do like it. Uh, <laughs> um, and all this has made a huge impact in our fundraising. So we started off in uh, announcing we were going to have a $1.5 billion campaign. The campaign uh, was the first in our history to be a billion-dollar campaign. The only other campaign we had before that was for $400 million. 
And that ended in 2002 when Laddie stepped down and he was successful. And that was actually the very first campaign the institution ever had, so we've had two. Uh, and, uh, and there was a lot of trepidation whether we could really raise that kind of money. Uh, well, I'm proud to tell you that this campaign ends in 2020, and we, will, we have already raised about $1.9 billion. So we blew past the goal very early. Last year, every year, those numbers don't really mean much, the goals, because every year we set in uh, uh, 17, 18, 19 uh, has been exceeded. And this past year, ending in June, we closed the year with $413 million in philanthropic investment in the institution. Um, and that's from 110,000 or so different donors, about 90% of them giving $100 or less, 25,000 of them new donors to the institution. Because our goal in the campaign, and we emphasize this a lot, even though the, the number was there, our real goal in the campaign was building a culture of philanthropy within the institution because we knew we were never ever going to see the state invest at the levels that they used to. We have to find new ways to generate income for the institution. Philanthropy is one of those ways, and so we're driving that. And then this, my last comment, said best by Alvin Toffler. And basically what it's saying is that we as universities have to do things differently, and if we can't do them, how are we gonna serve our students well? so that they can serve our communities and do the kinds of things we got to do when we graduated. Thank you very much. I think I blew past the question and answer period. <laughs> you did, but I think we have some time for some questions, if, uh, and this is a great opportunity for everybody who's engaged in strategic planning. <laughs> yes. You can go ahead. Them. Hi, so, um, I'm an international undergraduate student here at the business, in College of Business. So congratulations to ASU <laughs> for all the great pro progress. I mean, um, I saw 8.7% of students there are international students. So um, I would like to know what strategic plan do you think the students should have to success? Would you give any suggestions for them, especially for the international undergraduate students? So the international undergraduates that we recruit, and, uh, and we do have a large volume of them, um, the, uh, the biggest thing that most of them, well, there's two things. One is while they're students, is trying to make sure that they actually spend their social time with native English speakers. Because one of the reasons they came was to learn about American culture and American language. And so we find it very important to help them find ways to relate to uh, 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 Native Americans so that they can be engaged in a uh, different kind of dialogue than they do with their fellow students from their home country. The other side of it is on the graduation side, which is, uh, so we have been investing in career support for students back in their home countries. How can we help them with placement when they go home? And so that's part of what we're spending our time doing as well, which we think helps students find it more attractive to come because we can be of instrumental in helping them find opportunities when they graduate back in their country. Uh, some students take the optional practical training. We work hard to make sure that we provide them with that opportunity as well. But nonetheless, those are the, the kinds of things right off the top of my head that we're doing. Hi, I'm Robin Wegger from Financial Services. And I have a question about your slide about retention. Who designs your um, retention programs, and how do you manage those and monitor those so that you get your metrics? You're like channeling Michael Crow. Uh, <laughs> it's a question he says to me. He says, well, Mark, who's in charge? And I said, I am. <laughs> I said, when you appointed me, you said, Mark, you have to get the retention to 90%. I didn't delegate that away. I didn't say, well, I hope somebody else gets us there. And so there's a, there is a meeting in my office every three weeks with three of my vice provosts and my uh, vice president for enrollment to talk about what we're doing to drive greater retention. 
They, in turn, have meetings with, an, with a group of associate deans in every college. And I talk to the deans at every dean's council, at every dean's council, every month, and in retreat, there is always a topic of retention. It never is gone. Because the only way to succeed is the same thing that we talked about at the front end. You have to build a culture around it. You have to be committed to it constantly. It has to be part of the rhetoric constantly. And so what are we doing? When I talk to the Senate, I ask the faculty, well, what are you doing to help your students succeed? You know, if you're writing on a paper, I tell them this all the time, if you're writing on a paper, your writing really is horrible, you ought to do something about that. That's not really helpful to the student. <laughs> you know, okay, my writing's horrible, I got that. What am I to do? And so, finding ways to help direct them to the writing center, explain to them why the writing center can help, tell them that ask the writing center to give you some help about this, that, and the other thing. It's your sentence structure, your paragraph structure. Your thoughts are not continuous. Something so they go in, because they don't really know why their writing's horrible. They only know you've judged it to be horrible. And so for a lot of students for whom their preparation is not what we would like it to be, you need to give them some extra insight into what the issues are. Another retention slide question. There were huge drops in 06 and 11. You said you tried things and they didn't work. Can you share what didn't work? Uh, I don't remember in 06 specifically, but in, in 11, uh, it was, it strangely, it was the, first of all, the after effects of the, re of the recession. We were having real trouble just recruiting and uh, probably took in a higher proportion of ill-prepared students than we might have otherwise. We also tried working with the community colleges, not to offload them from a point of view of uh, the retention issue, but, but to try and figure out how they could maybe help us. We were thinking that they teach math in smaller groups and so forth than we did. This is before we discovered adaptive learning for math, and we were struggling to figure out how best to teach math. And so we thought they might be more successful with students because they have faculty who are more nurturing and supportive of that. That didn't work either. So those were a couple things that, that happened in, in 11. Yes? Um, in thinking about experiential learning, you mentioned um, study abroad, but going further to co-ops and internships, things like that, particularly for the students on the lower income end of the scale, um, what's the strategy you're using to promote co-ops and internships for those students in particular and across the board? So for internships, the traditional kind of internship, uh, if they're like full semester kind of internships, we're trying to make sure that they're st uh, structured in the summer so students can work, actually get paid for their internships. I'm actually sending two of my vice provosts uh, to University of Waterloo, very close to here, uh, because uh, they are remarkable in their co-op program, and their co-op program is for every degree program they offer, at least that's what their provost tells me. So we're <laughs> going to go and do some investigation to see what that's about and see how we might learn from them. Uh, we are also now looking at a software company called, it's either called Ripen or Ripen, and I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's R-I-I-P-E-N. And, uh, and uh, why we're interested in it is because they've devised a way, because where we think experiential learning is really needed is in the first two years, that students don't get sufficiently hooked into what they want to do because they don't get enough real practical hands-on kind of experience. And so this is a way to find employers who can, uh, can match with our students different opportunities where they can do it. And it could be very short term, you know, uh, minimal hours, those kinds of things. And so we're working for those kinds of solutions as well. So we're trying a variety of things to try and get there uh, to do that. And, uh, and then a lot of units have also figured out ways to give students uh, internship but spread it over multi-semesters at fewer hours per semester so that they're you know, getting some experience, but not necessarily a whole block where they can't get paid. So, those kind of things. This goes back to retention. Um, real quick, I teach chemistry, intro chemistry to engineering students. I always have them fill out a survey, one page, tell me what they did on this, over the summer on the back. For the first time ever, I said to my students, just don't turn it in, come to my office, hand it to me, I'm gonna gauge you in a conversation. So I've been asking these students, do they plan to stay here and graduate, or do they plan to transfer? <coughs> and I've already known this, but we have, at least in the STEM area, we have a significant number of students who view us here, UFM Dearborn, as a stepping stone 
to another institution, often Ann Arbor. So on the issue of retention, um, I, I feel that we might look bad if you adopt the traditional, you know, how many of your students graduated right. um, in four, five, six years. I've always known this. I feel that past administrators here and maybe current ones don't want to admit that we are a stepping stone often to other institutions and we worry about retention. Well, I, 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 would, I would answer it two ways. One is you should always look at the VSA rate, the Voluntary System of Accountability that's part of the national database uh, from IPEDS. And that simply tracks students who were enrolled in your institution to see if they're still enrolled in another institution. First of all, it will tell you exactly what institution they're enrolled in. So did they go to Ann Arbor? Or did they go to Wayne State? Or did they go to Flint? Or did they you know, not go anywhere? Or did they go back to community college because they decided to do something different? Um, but we used to have that same problem uh, and that worry because we would get a lot of kids from California. And uh, we would, the assumption was they, they, they chose ASU because they couldn't get into UCLA or UC Santa Barbara or UC San Diego, et cetera. And so they would do a year with ASU, show that they've got grades, and then transfer back. Well, that true, proved not to be true. I mean, it was true for a while. But as we made greater efforts to improve the quality of the experience the students got and built the rhetorical kind of stuff on the campuses about the kinds of experiences and then built new things. So my colleague at our uh, new College of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences on our West Campus, uh, which largely is only undergraduate. Uh, they have about seven master's programs and maybe one or two doctoral programs on the campus. Uh, but uh, the uh, dean of the college is a biologist. And uh, uh, so he uh, built uh, an undergraduate research program called INQUIRE, N-C-U-I-R-E, New College Undergraduate Interdisciplinary Research Experiences something like that. Um, and it has been an enormous magnet for students to stay because they start to see that I get to work in a lab with a professor. I even ultimately can participate in writing papers and these kinds of things. And for, for a lot of students, that's really exciting. For, and these are students who would not necessarily ever expect that they were going to be doing this. It's not just the top end students. It's open to all their students. And it has been very successful. So it's finding hooks also that make your place just like we have to make our place. Because you can imagine that if you're at the West Campus and you're only 20 miles from, from Tempe, you go, well, I'll just transfer to Tempe after a year or two, right? I'll just get my degree in the Tempe campus. Students have stopped doing that. And interestingly, we now have students who schedule their classes because we're a little different because we're run as uh, one institution. But we have students now who opt to take some of their classes at the West Campus in biology and take some in Tempe Campus, even though they're getting their degree from uh, the West Campus. But it's more convenient maybe because they work sometimes in that part of the town. And so they, they schedule it accordingly. Students were way ahead of us on this uh, in terms of we have literally thousands of students who go between the campuses taking courses because they've worked out what's best for them. So back. I was wondering if you could speak about the process that was used to come up with your strategic plan and the level of faculty buy-in that was there. So we didn't have a traditional strategic planning process uh, that is typical of, of a lot of institutions. Uh, and uh, it started, as I said, with really kind of the president talking about where we wanted to go from, right from the get-go and then shaping uh, goals and objectives by asking the units different questions. So for one of the questions I remember being asked uh, in the first year that Michael was um, uh, president, I was, the, was the last year I was a dean, and he said, which colleges or degree programs that you offer, like departments, do you aspire to be like? What's your aspirational goal? And that started to frame a whole conversation. Well, OK, well, why do you aspire to be like them? What is it about them that, because nobody's going to be identical to everybody else, and we didn't want to just emulate others, but we wanted to see what attributes different programs had that would help us in terms of aspiration. 
And we did that at the university level, too. So we have university peers, and many of which are aspirational, you know, institutions that we would like to have the same kind of performance as. Uh, but we're not prepared to sacrifice our access mission in order to get there. So we're committed to saying that we're going to do that no matter what. So in terms of the broad scale involvement, it really started at, you know, asking units about where they wanted to be and so forth, and then rolling that up to the colleges, and then rolling that up to the institution. But with the institution first saying, here's where we need to go, here are the kinds of general principles we're trying to work on, here's the aspiration we have. And so it was always somewhat iterative and, and interactive, um, and faculty were able to participate as they wished. I remember going to faculty, I will actually tell you this is probably one of the disappointments, the then provost and I went to the faculty. This is got to be 2009-ish or so, 10, and said, we need you to tell us what we need to do to improve retention. A year later, we got back nada. So at a certain point, we took control in a sense of said, well, okay, but here's some things we're going to try. Here's some things we're going to do. And so now, it's interesting, it actually more stuff comes from the faculty now than before. And we've now created something called the Innovation Collaboratory, which is uh, led by two uh, staff uh, around instructional design and good teaching uh, and so forth. And it has about 150 faculty and about 150 staff and I don't know how many students and they work on different projects together to try and figure out how to redesign the whole learning enterprise. And one of the things that we've challenged them to work on is rooms like this. Because if there's one truism that my CIO pointed out to me, if your grandmother came into this room, it would look strikingly familiar to the room that she sat in many, many years ago. And is this really the best way for us to teach? You know, we discovered something by accident recently in classroom design. Our uh, business faculty who like to have tiered classrooms like this, but differently constructed, but like this. Uh, we said, okay, well, well, we'll build this classroom, but we don't have the resources to actually build it tiered in this, because we meant renovating this existing building. So we bought high, basically higher level chairs and, and desks and then lower and lower. <laughs> they loved it. They want all their classrooms to be like that now. They don't want us to put in the tiered flooring anymore because they see more flexibility and more opportunity to do things. And so, you know, I guess I would say is that everybody has to come at this with an open mind and, and not think only in terms of uh, driving a particular point of view and trying to see what could be possible and what's worth trying. The costs of trying and failing are not great. It just means trying. And uh, you know, I tell my deans all the time, you know, especially new ones when they get hired, and they say, well, you know, what if I try this and it doesn't work? I said, well, okay, well, I hope you learn something from it. And I hope you do something differently the next time. I said, the only people, only deans who lose their jobs are the ones who have chronic failure. <laughs> you know, there's nothing they do that's successful. But the ones who try things and some are successful and some aren't, that's great. I got a law dean and he'll throw up a master's degree and say, well, three years in, we didn't get anybody to take it up. We're canceling the program. And I said, fine, move on. You know, so, you know, trying to have a little bit more flexibility in this. A lot of us, certainly I was like this when I was a faculty member. You know, of course I developed, I hung on to with such tremendous commitment. And so three years ago, two years ago, I asked my vice provost for undergraduate education, how many courses do we have on the books that haven't been taught for three years? 3,000. So we sent them all to the appropriate units and said, if you want to keep it, send us back an explanation as to why. We eliminated 3,000 courses. <laughs> because faculty move on, people are gone from the institution, nobody thinks about that course anymore, et cetera, but they live on as legacies. Hi, my name is Helen Judge Gonzalez, and I direct programming for non grad students and then teach part-time in language, culture, and communication. Uh, one of the things I've been doing for the last six months is working on a re and retention in the College of Arts, Sciences, and Letters, and that came uh, resulted in a white paper. And a lot of what you're talking about up here is reflected in the white paper. 
I have a question about your high uh, drop fail or withdrawal courses. You showed a slide about improvements there. Did you have a particular strategy that was applicable to most of those uh, courses, or was it left up to the individual units to come up with course redesigns, or how did you make those improvements? So we we engaged the units because we couldn't do it. I mean, so. In math, we said, we've found this software. You guys need to evaluate it and tell us whether or not it's actually any good. And they evaluated it, and we said, OK. And we had some uh, computer science folks who helped build the smart tutor around it, so it would be even more helpful. And they, they like it. I should also tell you that some of the, one of the fears we get is that this technology is somehow displacing people. We've got more employees and more faculty now than we've ever had. I hire at a rate unlike probably any other institution in the country. My college of liberal arts and sciences on the Tempe campus this year hired 52 new faculty. That dean asked his counterpart at Ohio State and at Washington how many they hired, and it was 12 and 15, respectively. Uh, overall, we hired 112 new tenure, tenure track faculty this year. I authorized last year 199 searches. I always authorize about a third more searches than I have money for because faculty are rightfully picky. They look carefully at who they want to hire. And so I know we're not going to fill all those slots. And quite honestly, it'd be the best problem I've got if they actually were all successful in getting their number one picks to come and we could hire all those great people. But that doesn't happen. So I do a lot of those kinds of things. But I have a high risk tolerance. Um, and I believe firmly in going to my president saying, I have a forgiveness issue here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so we did that. In psych, it was different what they needed than uh, uh, economics. Uh, and, and nobody, they're not necessarily using the same software products or those kinds of things because they all have different kind of approaches as to how they want to do this. We simply provide helpful expertise and, and, and uh, any other information we can, but they ultimately are making the decision, and we never imposed on anybody that they had to do this. We simply pointed out to them, your, your D, we don't give an F, we give an E. Uh, your D, E, W rate, your D's failures and withdrawals, was like enormous. Don't you think you should give some attention to how you could rectify this situation? And everybody wants to do that. So then it was just giving them some help to do that. And you know, so also helping and invest in them in terms of providing them with some financial resources if that redesign was going to cost some money so that they could you know, feel that we were in there with them, not just, uh, just rhetorically. Can you speak a little bit about your A and B terms and how you introduce those to your students? Do you see that need um, or, or wish for those types of classes to grow? And in what types of the students are your students? So, the A and B was, of course, driven because we needed to have it aligned with online. And, uh, but then we realized it could have a benefit for the face-to-face -face students. And, uh, and so we went to the Academic Senate and we said, this is what we'd like to propose. They have to approve it. We couldn't just do it. Uh, and uh, contrary to what most people think, we don't just pronounce. Uh, <laughs> and so we went to the Senate and we said, you know, here's what we're thinking about. And here's why. And they approved it without much, you know, I mean, they spent a couple of meetings talking about it, and then they approved it. I got more pushback over moving spring break, spring break up a week than I ever got on A and B. Um, and um, so A and B sessions are, can be for any course. We don't really <laughs> regulate it for whether it's for first year students or seniors or grad students or whatever. The units have to make those decisions. <laughs> they know their circumstances best. They know their content best. What could be accomplished in that? The same thing is true online. So for online, even though we wanted to drive everything to seven and a half weeks, because that works best for most online learners, there's some content. So that doesn't work. So electrical engineering said to us, look, we've got a couple classes we can't do in seven and a half weeks. We said, fine. So we do those online over 15 weeks. And so we try not to, biochemistry is now online. And we have 700 plus students in our biochemistry online, but biochemistry said, we can't teach the labs online. We're just not there yet with technology to be able to teach biochemistry online. Okay, you don't have to convince me, I believe you. If you, you guys are the biochemists and you say that, it must be true. 
okay, so what's the solution? What would you do to teach an online biochemistry degree but have the labs in person or how would you deal with it? So they developed the whole program and they decided they would do the labs for the first year experience in a seven day intensive. Students would have to come to campus and do it in seven days and it's all day for seven days. And what they learned from this is they actually think the students' lab experiences that way for their first year are richer than the students who come face to face and do a lab once a week. Because the intensity builds so much more involvement in the actual experience. And they do that for the second year as well. And now we have hundreds of students who come to campus for one week to do this and complete their online degrees. Because we've got, remember you have a whole different body of students. These are students, we got students who are nurses who are missing a biochemistry training and they're thinking about going back to become a physician. We've got students who are um, medics in the army and they want to get uh, a degree. We've got students who are uh, 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 doing work in labs and, and uh, the commercial end and they'd like to get more training in this space. So we get, you know, when you look at them, we did this little video of, the, of them. I mean, there was, you know, I don't think anybody was under 35 years of age. So a lot of experience, it's very interesting. I, uh, I know that we probably have a lot of uh, uh, questions for Mark, and uh, you can either contact him uh, <laughs> yes. uh, offline, or you can ask me and I'll contact him, and uh, we can get, back, get you answers back. But I do want to thank you all for attending on a Friday morning, and I especially want to thank Mark for an outstanding presentation.